Welcome to episode 83 of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest is Joshua Thompson. He is a model, an actor, and a content creator on Instagram and on YouTube. He has hundreds of thousands of followers and tens of millions of views. Joshua has a very unique background where he was born as a TCK in Japan, where he attended elementary school at a public school, then went to international school, CAJ for middle school, then back to public school for high school. This very unique educational background gave me an opportunity to ask him about compara comparisons between international schools and public schools. And on top of that, we had the opportunity to talk about matters such as identity. Uh, it was a very fruitful discussion, and uh, it was great to meet Joshua in person because I had actually come across his Instagram reels um, months ago, and uh, it was sent to me by a friend, and he was like, hey, check it out. And then here we are um, several months later connecting with each other through my podcast. So here we are, episode 83, Tokyo Alumni Podcast, Joshua Thompson. Welcome to episode 83. Today we have Joshua Thompson. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Joshua. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. So um, I know I already had an intro, but if you want to just briefly do like a 30 second introduction for the audience, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. Hi, my, my name is Joshua Thompson. I was born and raised in Tokyo and my parents are from Hokkaido. Their parents came from the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Um, I went to Japanese school, but I also lived in the States and I was like, three to five. I also went to CAJ, um, this American school in Tokyo from the age of 12 to 14, I guess. But I went back to Japanese school. But after that, I just went into showbiz in Japan and been doing that for on and off 10 years. But I came to, came to the UK first in 2018, but I've been going back and forth between Japan and the UK since. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're going to focus probably on two things today, right? One, is that you're like a true TCK. Like I always tell people I'm kind of a fake TCK, right? In the sense that I'm half Japanese. Uh, and I feel like a lot of inter kids aren't truly, right, TCKs in the sense that they're raised, especially at school like ASIJ, St. Mary's, very right? international. And then on, and then uh, second half, if we could talk a bit about showbiz, uh, I think that would be great. So mm -hmm. uh, going to the first topic, um, a lot of people ask me all the time, should my kid go to INTA? <laughs> and, you know, like, is Japanese school better or international school? And I think you're one of the few people that can attest directly to experiencing both. So mm -hmm. in your case, like what led you to go to INTA quite late in the game, right? At age 12. And so, uh, yeah. yeah, let's start there. Sorry. I think it's, it was always my family's policy to send us to elementary school first, then to international school from there because they... My parents wanted me to have that basic Japanese knowledge and be able to connect with the locals and then improve our English from middle school and on beyond. And I think it worked for my sister but and my brother, but I think I, I got too comfortable going to Japanese school. And for so the transition to international school from Japanese school was quite hard for me. Nothing was coming in and all that, but... And you said the transition was difficult. Um, sort of the stereotypes I hear is mathematics is far more advanced at Japanese schools. And I'm guessing what you struggled with was, was it the English part or, you know, so sorry to kind I of give you a twofer there. It really was the English part, I think. Mathematics, not so much, but I think, yeah, I just really, I just struggled like learning in English because I was doing it in Japanese my whole life uh, until like 12. And suddenly I have to do everything in English. And I'm just like, what is going on? I don't know these words. Like nothing was coming in. And I, my brain just was not comprehending. I was just like, Arr! and then I was like failing a lot of classes. And like, I and people thought I was like dumb. I was just like purely dumb. But I, I just was not understanding what was going on. I, I did understand English, but I just didn't know how to convey my ideas or like my opinion I was just like what is going on and because uh, yeah so it's quite stressful but 
thinking back now, I'm really grateful that I went to CAG because now I've got things that I can like, write essays, I can do presentations and all that. And yeah. At a, in a social perspective, um, were you one of the only non-Japanese kids in elementary school? And was that transition, I, I, I would assume was maybe more comforting, but it sounds like, you know, based on hearing you outside the podcast that maybe you were more comfortable in the Japanese system. Oh, surprisingly, I was like very comfortable in Japanese school. Like, yeah, I was the only non-Japanese, I guess, but my cousin was in my same grade and she's half Japanese. So she looks like a Hafu, but so she like, and my siblings were in the same school as me and my other cousins were also in the same elementary school. So I didn't feel like I was the only foreigner in the in the school, but yeah, I guess I just felt so comfortable in Japanese school, like going to international school. I was like, I did not feel because like CJ is pretty much American and I didn't feel American at all. And I just didn't know how to connect with these foreigners. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, and they go back to the States every summer and like, they have, they're like very American and like, I'm just like very much Japanese from Saitama. And I'm just like, how, like, I just didn't know how to in like connect with these people. But I, I think down the line, I just got, I learned how to be myself. But at the same time, I just, I just couldn't bear like that culture of like that international American bubble, I guess. And I think identity is a big thing with international kids, TCK kids. Um, and you're especially unique, right? It was just even interesting listening to essentially like a white guy saying, right? Like there's these foreigners I can't adjust to. I miss my Japanese cohort. So like, um, do, do would you say in in many ways you would identify more with your Japanese part, like even though you're not, but the blood's not there. Do, do yeah. you identify stronger with Japan than uh, your parents' uh, roots? Yeah, of course, um, hundred percent. Like because even my parents, they're not from the West. Like they grew up in Hokkaido, right? Like even my parents. So my mom went to Japanese school. My dad only went to international school, but they both grew up in Japan. So even they don't really have their own country's identity like they they're like very much like super tck neutral kind of people so the only thing i had was like the country i grew up in it was in which was japan and even my cousins they all grew up in japan right and we just speak japanese and like like the only time i spoke english was to my grandparents that live like 10 minutes away but I think, yeah, I, but at the same time, I didn't really feel 100% Japanese because I did live in the States from the age of three to five. So I did have that basic knowledge of the U.S. and the West and like English speaking, uh, like the culture, right? But yeah, it's very, very complex. But yeah, I guess I was more Japanese than American or British, I guess. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I want to go back to sort of you going into INTA. I think a lot, again, as I mentioned, like literally as before we're having this conversation, I was thinking about how many of my friends have asked me this question, right? Should I send mm -hmm. my kid to INTA? Oh, yeah. So, you know, from your perspective, um, what are your thoughts on um, essentially, actually, many of my friends have mentioned sort of the path you went, keeping kids in Japanese school until the end of elementary school putting them in INTA in middle school. So someone who's experienced that firsthand, I'm sure you've also followed your friends who maybe entered earlier or later. What do you think are the pros and cons of, of waiting until, you know, uh, grade six or seven? No, God, I feel like it really depends on the person as well. But like, I see many international school kids that went to international school their whole life now struggling to connect with Japan, to connect with the country they grew up in or speak the language, you know, or like write and read like kanji and all that. But at the same time, sending your kids to international school like really broadens your perspective and like it really helps you um, connect with international people and like just not be stuck in one country. 
but I feel like the transition for some kids, it could be really, really difficult. But I think it was especially difficult for me because I don't know, like I didn't really speak English to my parents either. I was just using Japanese. I really, it really depends on the kid, is what I really always say. It's like, it really depends on the kid or like what they want to do, what they're saying they think they should do. It's like, so really, I should, I think their parents should really listen to the kids. Like, what do you think is best for you? What do you want? I mean, they, they, you need to push your kids a little bit, but I really wish my parents were like, Okay, so Joshua, what do you really prefer here? What do you really want to do? You know? But at the end, like, they listen. They, they send me back to Japanese school. But, so, it really, like, if you're sending your kid to, like, international school the whole time, like, at least give them the opportunity to, like, connect with the local country and, like, connect with Japan and, like, take them to Japanese, like, uh, make them, like, take Japanese classes and all that, maybe. Like, it really... I've seen really a lot of international school kids just like miss that opportunity of like connecting with Japan and like the real side of Japan. And I think they realize when they're adults that they kind of miss that part. And like they're the, the only country they identify is with international school. <laughs> you know, that's the only country they like feel like they belong to but I wasn't like that I was like very much immersed into like the Japanese culture and all that so I feel like it really is good to send your kids to international school but at the same time like try to try making them to like connect with the local country is what I would say yeah yeah I, th I thought that was a very TCK thing when he said Hontoni really depends on the kid um, and it reminded me of you were just earlier kind of alluding to your siblings and it kind of reminded me of, you know, international school is also various siblings. Uh, sometimes you get one kid that, you know, goes to the States, never comes back to Japan, like visits once every five, six years. And then you get the kid who, you know, comes right back to Japan after graduation and, and never leaves. So mm -hmm. w would you say your family was, was similar in the sense that you, you're saying that your siblings kept going international school? but you are sort of the most quote unquote Japanese of your siblings. I think so. Yeah. Because my, si it was really interesting because my sister, she was in the States from the age of like eight to 10. So I think because of that, she was able to go into international school more easily. But for me, because I was so young, my, my English didn't really stick with me. And my brother, um, I think he couldn't, go into cj right away so he had to go to this other smaller very very small international school in like ome ome tokyo and so like my sister she was fine like she's really smart and she just she loves studying and all that my brother he had to go to this small international school first then go into cj from high school than me going into CAJ from middle school, but I just couldn't stand it. So, and I was like, I think my, I really resonated with the Japanese culture and like, it just, I just love the language a lot. And my humor was very Japanese and I love my friends a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's a great point you bring. I think that the circumstantial situations, right. Depending on how many years people spend in the States, and and I, I really like the point you said earlier, though, that communicate with your kids, right? That you, you're just going to get inevitably, if you, especially if you have three, four kids, some are going to love Inta and some are going to hate it. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's a great point that there's really no one route. And I think the other point you brought up, too, is incredibly important. And maybe this is this is also a point that maybe you could sort of compound on is that you, you mentioned how I think you're kind of expressing it maybe in a rather nice way, but I'll maybe put it in a slightly meaner way. But like a lot of Inta kids, I think rightfully accused for living in a bubble, right? They, mm. they have their bubble. They won't leave their bubble. They stay in their bubble. Some of them all the way, right? Like beyond high school and college, they'll just stay with their inter friends and never really experience Japan, right? Mm. So what would you recommend though for that type of, you know, let's say their parents, right, of kids at Inta. Uh, ways, yeah. Could, could someone break that bubble? 
I feel like sending them to like Kumon from like elementary school that really helps. Like Kumon or like just like naraigoto ってなに like after class nani like dance class or whatever like send them to like really local real Japanese classes after mm-hmm. school like that really helps you connect with the people it, like you learn how to communicate with Japanese people I think and I I went to like dance school after school like every Wednesday and that really taught me how to communicate with like none at all older people outside of school really I think it really helps like a lot of my Japanese friends that went to CAJ I think they went to I don't know juku cram, cram school cram school yeah, cram school after after CAJ and like that really helped them speak Japanese like learn Japanese demo I feel like it's really hard for non East Asian people to go get outside that bubble because their parents are not Japanese and they're 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 they don't their parents don't know how to send their kids to like a really Japanese environment I guess like because they if the parents don't know how to connect like how can the kids do it you know like there's a that's too much of a burden for the kids to just go out in the field and like go to go take Japanese classes when your parents don't really speak Japanese it is a bit hard but so net I think you should really force your kids to connect with people outside of the bubble because that's the only thing you know because nobody teaches you what it's like outside that bubble because you're you're you don't you had no choice but to go to the international school right and you you don't know how to get out of that bubble because nobody shows you like a example of how to do things so i think it's the adult's responsibility to show them and explore and go outside that bubble i guess yeah yeah i that's a great point i think naraigoto right the after school lessons I, you're probably correct. I mean, when I think of my own experience, uh, went to Kumon a bit. I'm not sure if I'll ever recommend that to anyone, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I played Love football. That. Yeah, I, I didn't really enjoy that much. Also, wasn't as uh, social, but, you know, things like soccer. Uh, I mm. played football, you know, with with local kids. And um, that type of experience was invaluable. And as you said, like, even, you know, obviously you want your kids to have fun, but just being able to code switch, being able to communicate with other people um mm. and there are a select few of pe- kids that maybe they go to some private you know liberal arts school in college with all other international schools and then they go to a company i don't know like goldman sachs or something where it's a bunch of other inta and they marry mm. someone from inta but again that's a small group of people right most people at some point in their career are, are going to interact with japanese people especially if they're going to be working in Tokyo. And and I totally agree with you that um, I, I do see a spread even within my school, in my grade level, those, you know, hafus who have that capacity of being able to code switch, being able to communicate with Japanese people. And then those who are just kind of like, they, they just, they don't know. They don't know how to do it because they are never taught. You know, they just, they went to, uh, you know, the Tokyo American Club, you know, every yeah. weekend. Ah. It, it, yeah, they went bowling, you know, every weekend and, you know, they, they never left that community. And um, uh, I do I do agree with you that it feels like a waste. You know, you you have a brilliant country with, a, you know, this robust city with 20 million people. Why why go to the same building <laughs> every yeah. weekend? It, 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 that's just really inhibiting your child's potential. But at the same time, I was very jealous or like envious of those people because like, I didn't look Japanese. I don't look Japanese. And like, I was like, it looked really fun to be in that bubble, like very luxurious international bubble. So whenever I went to like tack and stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, what a life you have. Like, mm. like imagine like, because I, I didn't like standing out, but I was forced to stand out. And I was like, if I'm in this bubble, I don't have to stand out, you know? And like, it must be really comfortable. But thinking back now, I'm like, thank God I had that outlet. Uh, so we're going to switch gears now and, uh, you know, talk about what you do. Um, and uh, a big part of what you do is content creation. 
Um, mm -hmm. We have 100,000 followers now on Instagram. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, you know, I, I, I think entertainment is not really a common route many people choose. So what took you into that realm? And, um, you know, I think a lot of your content's also very sort of bilingual, bicultural, that type of angle. Um, mm. yeah, was there sort of a specific impetus to start that? And, um, you know, what got you involved in the first place? I mean, first of all, like, I really wanted to be in Japanese TV since I was like 10 or nine. Like, I, I was, I would, I wanted to be like a talento, talento on Japanese TV. And then, so I knew what I wanted to do since I was 10. So I was like, how, how do I do this? Then, so in, when I was in high school, I just rang up many agencies and I was like, can I sign up with you? Can I sign up with you? And then I signed up with many agencies. I just, I went to many auditions. I went, I did a lot of extra gigs. I got commercial gigs and all that since I was like 18. A lot of, I did a lot of TV dramas, TV shows, commercials and all that. Then I think when COVID hit, I started doing podcast with people like me. Like so my best very good friend, he's Brazilian, but he was born and raised in Japan. So I want to do like a podcast with him, like an episode with him talking about our identities and all that. And then I really enjoyed that. So I was like, um, then I moved to Okinawa for like four months for work. Then I started doing radio on this radio station called FM Naha just for two months. And I just did the same thing, like interviewing like other international people. And then when I was going back to Tokyo from Okinawa, my cousin was going to do YouTube. And then I was like, maybe I can be the producer. Then we started doing YouTube together. Then I we talked about our identity issues and like identity crises and all that. And we just, and really, and, and it really took off. Like re people really loved what we did. Then I went independent. Then I started my English channel first. Then I transitioned to my Japanese channel and that really took off. So I, I was first doing YouTube full time. But then uh, since this January, this past January, like I just started doing skits on Instagram and that really blew up. And like, I've got like maybe almost 50 million views since January, maybe. So it's, it really blew up. And yeah, that's how my career started, I guess. But my background is acting, basically. So from age yeah. 10, you, you always knew something yeah. like entertainment yeah i just and, knew yeah that's interesting and how you know you said from this january is when you know your content really started to you know grow in popularity 50 million views so uh, as you mentioned earlier a lot of your content is kind of like uh, maybe not a lot but some of your content is about bicultural bilingual tck mm -hmm. um throughout interviewing people you know with similar backgrounds as you, to a certain degree, us, have you noticed any trends? And um, or uh, when when you talk to yeah, when you talk to other TCKs, or do you feel like everyone's journey is quite unique? Yeah, like I thought it. Everybody had the same experience as me, but it really, really depends on the person. Is what I've noticed, and and what this is like a very. It was like a very eye opening uh, realization, but like I thought my experience was quite similar to others but i didn't realize that i was like third generation and like everybody else is like second generation right mm -hmm. so i didn't realize how different that could be as well because i the reason why i feel very japanese is because even my parents are from japan right but other non-japanese people that grew up in japan their parents are from foreign countries like they're actually non-japanese you know so that got up i think they i think they've had it harder i guess in a way because their parents are not from japan and they had to navigate through that but my parents are from japan so i knew like i had parents to talk to about the same problem like i can talk to them about 
how difficult it is to go to Japanese school not looking Japanese or like I can ask them about my homework or whatever but I think other second generation people they really are had it harder but I thought my experience was yeah very similar to others but I it was like th this past few months I finally realized that my experience is like very different to others because I'm third generation and because I, and I, how I feel is very different because of being third generation is what I've noticed I think because nanka I think I thought I didn't know why I feel very Japanese and why I like I'm I speak better Japanese than English and I'm just like I was like like I think it was because I'm third generation I think and but it really really depends on the person because I know this Italian guy that was that was born and raised in Japan but his his Japanese is better than his Italian of course but he still thinks he's Italian like how he feels mm -hmm. and what he says is that he's Italian right so I'm like oh interesting because I don't feel British at all, even though my passport's British, but that's because only my grandmother is British and I didn't really come to the UK growing up. But I think he went back to Italy quite often. His parents are Italian. So I was like kind of projecting my view on him being mm. like, but how can you be Italian when you're not from <laughs> Italy? But yeah. that's because his parents are actually Italian and he went back to Italy every summer or something. But I, I'm not, that you know so I think I had to drop that and be like okay so yeah my experience is very different to his and it really and also this is really interesting and all there's a big difference between being born and raised in the, the countryside and the city like yeah. especially Tokyo like when you're in that international bubble like you don't really question your identity too much because you're in that bubble mm -hmm. but when you're from the countryside like you're you're really forced to think that you're different and like you you're forced to think like that you're not one of them you know yeah yeah but uh, I think I had it easier than the countryside people because I had international schools around me I got to go to like I got to go on base sometimes get like American food or whatever and I had a lot of foreigners around me or like I would go to church and like I would meet like many international people so in that regard I think I had a very fortunate upbringing compared to other foreigners that grew up in Japan I guess so that's why I've been able to do what I do I think yeah mm -hmm. I think um what you mentioned about even in Japan, where you grow up, that is such an important point. And I was going to say, you kind of separate it as rural and city, but I think there's even another layer to it would be within, you know, your Saitamas, Tokyo, Chibas, where, right? Because nowadays, um, and you alluded to this too, when, like people 30, 40 years ago, you, you were, you're pretty isolated no matter what, but it seems like certain places like Minato, Ward, for example, although it's very expensive to live in, it, it seems like their schools have plenty of non-Japanese. So uh, definitely times are changing. And um, yeah. I thought you, you brought up a great point too about everyone's journey is different, not being too judgmental, I guess, right? Of people's identities. I actually had a similar experience with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the baseball player, Lars Newbar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, my initial reaction when he was on the team was like, well, what's this American? You know, <laughs> like he doesn't speak Japanese, you know, like, what he's doing and then you know as you kind of follow his story it turns out you know he's always wanted to play for japan you know he, he's always yearned to be there he's you know he he was they invited japanese baseball players over so like he had these you know in his own way he was connected to japan even though he wasn't raised and i found myself gatekeeping what it means to be japanese you know mm. which is exactly what other people have always been doing to me my whole life Mm -hmm. so, you're not <laughs> Japanese right you're not actually Japanese and I was like oh this is interesting so yeah that's really interesting that you went through a similar sort of like renaissance cool. per se so, yeah. of, uh, perspective we'll transition now to the last question of this interview which is um the uh I like to ask guests where they see themselves three to five years from now or you're you're in your 20s so 30 years from now 
however far or near uh, in the future, uh, you know, what do you see yourself doing? And this is going to be in the internet forever. So you can always come back and <laughs> see what you said in 2024. Oh my gosh. Um, I think I would be producing documentaries. I think, I think I want to produce documentaries and I'll, I think I'll be flying around. That's mm -hmm. my dream. I want, I don't want to settle in one place. I met, I might, want to have a base mm. but i'll be traveling around i want to be flying around making documentaries making maybe even movies i don't know but yeah that'll be my dream i guess and future me would be happy with this I guess. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully that's awesome yeah, yeah. And i think a lot of tck's as well as inta kids can relate to that right that none of us really like to settle we we want everything right uh, <laughs> nothing and everything all at once um but that's awesome with the you know documentaries uh, i certainly look forward um, to seeing yeah. one of those films F future me will be watching that film <laughs> <laughs> you got that is <laughs> on that note uh that wraps up episode 83 uh thank you so much uh for coming on to the podcast joshua thank that's you thank you very much mm -hmm.